work it, make it, do it, make sense. Let's try again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. I know this is the last session right before lunch, but you still should have some leftover energy from breakfast. Uh, all right. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I work for Amazon Web Services. Um, we're going to talk about um, Docker and Kubernetes, what are the two frameworks, and how we can choose between one or the other. Um, so I'm a Docker captain. I'm very proud to be Docker captain. There are about 70 of us around the world that are recognized by the company Docker Inc. because I've been talking about Docker since very early versions, like 0.3, 0.4-ish. I've written a book uh, about Docker. Um, I literally finished authoring my book for O'Reilly on Kubernetes. So I, I know a few things about both of those technologies. Uh, and I've been a Java 1 rock star for four years uh, in a row. Um, so I know about these technologies, so hopefully you should get some tips from here. I always end up learning more from the audience than I share with the audience, so thank you for showing up. So let's take a look at a very high level. By the way, this is not going to be a Docker 101. Um, I don't, don't expect me to teach you the basic Docker here. How many people are using Docker in some shape and form today? Cool. Okay, almost 90% of the room. Uh, for others, I will say RTFM, and I'll go find out your Docker basics over there. But at a very high level, um, what is the Docker flow? You know, we have got three main components. We've got a client, uh, which is on the left here. Then there's a Docker host in the middle, and then there is a Docker registry, which is on the far right. Um, end of the day, you want to run a container, so the client says, hey, run a container. Um, the container is for a particular image. So you say, download this image and run the container. Well, download is implicit in the run part of it. But then you give the command to a host, and then the host says, oh, I don't have the image. I'm going to go download the image by default from Docker Hub, which is a registry, or hub.docker.com. It downloads the image on the host, it stores the image on the host, and it runs the container. The client, in that sense, is completely stateless. It gives the command. It's a CLI. Under the wire, it goes as a REST API, which goes to the host. And the host understands that REST API, does the right thing, basically downloading the image from the hub or a private registry, you know, let's say hosted on Amazon ECR. It can download the image, and once the image is downloaded, it will run the container over there. The entire state is essentially managed on the host. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a single host, but this could very easily be a multi-host solution as well. And that's exactly where your orchestration framework kick in. You don't want to build a distributed application on a single host because that's a single point of failure. When you build it on a multi-host, that's exactly where you need, hey, I'm going to run a Java application which consists of an application server, a database server, a caching, different components, and possibly multiple instances of those. So your typical Java application is a multi-container application. In order to run that multi-container application on a multiple host, you need that orchestration framework that will basically not only do the container scheduling, but will also be able to manage your cluster, give you the lifecycle management and all those operations. So essentially what we will do in this talk is compare Docker and Kubernetes. How are those two, what are the capabilities, pros and cons of each of those? So what we're going to cover in this talk is, first from the developer perspective, we're going to cover the core concepts. Like when you are building the application, you need to understand what the core concepts are. Um, cluster, single master, multi-master, how do you do that? You know, service discovery and load balancing, persistent volumes, which is required typically for a stateful container. And then how do I do my local development? And then from the ops perspective, we get a little bit into the architecture side of it. How can I do a multi-master? How does my scheduling algorithm work? particularly in a multi-host environment, um, what are my rules and constraints by which I can say run a container on a specific host? How can I do monitoring, rolling update? So we'll talk about each of these features in this talk. Jump straight away. You know, in Docker, you know, um, Docker Swarm is a feature that is one of the features of Docker Engine itself, or at least starting with version 1.12. Um, the way you download Docker is you go to docker.com, you say get Docker, and then there, are, there is a community edition and there is an enterprise edition. Community edition is typically what I use. In community edition, there is a stable, which is done pretty much every three months, or there is an edge build, which is done once a month, which is basically the bleeding edge build. So I like to be in the bleeding edge, and so what I have is Docker CE for Mac Edge. That's sort of my uh, classification here. Now, 
once I download the Docker CE for Mac here, then I say Docker Swarm in it, and that's going to start my cluster. It's a feature that needs to be explicitly enabled, and that's how you enable orchestration or container scheduling in Docker. Um, I, can, I need to say what is the address where I might be listening, because I may have a multi-host um, network card here, so I just need to specify that address. Um, the yellow indicates that by default is going to be a single master. Uh, the master gives me a worker token or a manager token. Um, I can grab the worker token. I can say, you know what, take this Docker new node, basically a new machine or a VM, doesn't matter. But then I can say, hey, this node is going to join the original master. And by giving the worker token or the manager token, I can create the cluster accordingly. So very easy to create a multi-node cluster using Docker. So here what I have is single master and five workers, essentially. I can very easily create a multi-master uh, cluster as well, uh, because in this case you can see there is a primary, there is a secondary, and five workers surrounding it. From the client perspective, when you're making a request, you could make a request to the secondary, it is automatically proxied to the primary, and the primary is the one that is responsible for actually executing the results uh, or scheduling containers across the different workers. By default, your containers will run on the manager as well, but you can say, you know what, the manager is only administrative, in which case the containers will run only on the worker. So those configurations are possible depending upon how you configure your Docker host. So some of the further core concepts, you know, you have multiple masters and you have multiple workers over here. All the managers, so to say, manager slash master is you know, equivalent terminology, but um, all the masters are configured in a raft consensus protocol. It is highly recommended, rather a very strong design pattern where you have odd number of managers. You know, you don't want to have even number of managers because if the network splits, then it's very difficult to figure out which one is the leader. And so if you have one, three, or five number of worker, managers, in case of a network split, at least one portion of the network has you know, more managers and they can elect a leader. And that's sort of defined by how craft consensus protocol works. On the bottom layer, what you see is your workers. Uh, these workers talk to each other using gossip network. And you can see the red ones are sort of one container. And this is essentially one service spread over multiple hosts. And similarly, the green containers are spread across multiple hosts. So service is a concept of Docker, where it says service can have multiple tasks, and each task is essentially a container. Now, how do I fire up a service? Um, let's say I'm a Java developer. I want to fire up a Wildfly container. So all I will do is Docker service create. So uh, Docker is a CLI. Service is the main command, and then I'm saying create, which is a subcommand of service. And then I'm saying dash dash replicas three. What that means is create three replicas of this service. Uh, I'm giving this service a name called as web, and, and then I'm giving the image. Uh, so in this case, basically, it downloads the image on the three hosts that have been identified by Docker host, and it runs the container on that. There are ways by which you can influence where to run it, but by default, it pretty much works. Now, certain concepts can happen where a node may fail once your service is running or once a container is running up there. What if the node fails? Docker host sees the desired is not matching the equal or the actual. So you know, it does a reconciliation in that case, and it says, oh, by the way, the node has gone down, the heartbeat has failed, so I'm going to reschedule this container on a different host. So it's a declarative state of the service that you give which Docker host ensures. So you say three replicas, Docker makes sure that I'm going to run three replicas if the host goes down. Well, the host may not go down, but the container may go down in that case. If the container goes down, same thing. It says, hey, desired is not equivalent to actual, so I'm going to spin up the container based upon the scheduling algorithm, and I will make sure the service state is reconciled. At any given point of time, you said, Three containers need to run, or three replicas need to run, and I'm going to run three replicas. Scaling the service is pretty easy as well. I want to scale the number of replicas for the service. Instead of three, now I want to run six replicas of the service. So all you do is Docker service, which is my main command, then scale is a subcommand, give the service name, and then you see the number of replicas. So to Docker service scale web equals six, and that's about it. That runs basically, automatically scales it to six uh, different replicas.
We saw the replicated service. There is a concept of a global service. Let's say I want to run a single instance of a container on each node of the cluster. So Prometheus, for example, is a good example where you want to run a logging service which reports metrics about your host. So you can say dash dash mode equal global. Now it's running a single instance of your service on each node of the cluster. And if a new node is added to the cluster, it will automatically have that in service running or the container running on it. So think about replicated service versus global service. What do you want to start? Typically, um, replicated service is what you intend to start. That's my sort of core concepts of Docker now. Let's take a look at Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is again a scheduler or, or container orchestration platform. Um, the typical confusion is scheduler is the concept where the core of the orchestration platform says, I know how to schedule the container on different hosts. But if you up-level yourself, the orchestration means you're also responsible for the cluster management and those aspects, the certificates, etc. So Kubernetes and Docker both are, in that sense, orchestration platforms. But they also have a scheduler built into them. Now, Kubernetes is container agnostic, uh, but pretty much 99% of the times, Docker is the primary container that they're using. Anybody familiar with Rocket container here? Anybody using Rocket in production? There was one hand that went up familiar with Rocket. That's pretty much what I've seen. And it's okay, because um, by default, I've been giving this talk workshop for almost two, two and a half years now. That's pretty much the consistent feedback that I've seen in terms of Rocket adoption. So yes, Kubernetes is container agnostic, but pretty much Docker is sort of the big gorilla over there. That's the container format that it supports. So in terms of Kubernetes, you have a node. On the node, you have a Docker host running, so to say. Um, Kubernetes defines this concept of a pod. Pod is a co-located group of containers that share IP, storage, volume, namespace, so to say, together, where all the containers running in a pod, they can talk to each other using localhost. They don't have to rely upon an IP address. But what that means is, or what that doesn't mean is, rather, you would not put your database and an application server and a cache in together in the same pod. They need to be in separate pods because their scalability requirements are different. So you would put, for example, maybe a Wildfly container and maybe a logging container or a proxy container or a cache container over there, but that's about it. So you really have to think about your unit on which you want to scale, and that's basically what defines a pod. Now, you would typically wrap your pod in a replica set because you want to run a certain number of replicas of the pod. So replica set is basically saying, okay, run so many replicas. So the way we have in Docker, say Docker service scale, instead of that, you have a replica set here. How do we start this? How do we run this? How do we create this? Hang in there for a second. Now, pods, just like containers, are ephemeral. What that means is if a pod dies on a host and it comes up on a different host, it may be assigned a different IP address. But as a Java developer, if you're building a Java application and relying upon a database, you can't really rely upon the IP address. So that's where service comes in. <clears throat> service is a single stable name for a set of pods, and it also acts as a load balancer. So you can say, here is the DB service name. So I'm running two couch-based pods. I cannot rely upon their IP address, but I, what I will do is I will refer from my Java application to the DB service. And then behind the scene, it will do the load balancing for me and pick the right pod for me. And how does it done? Uh, essentially, what you're saying is, you know, I, each pod, when it comes up, the pod has a certain label. Those labels are stored in etcd, which is a distributed watchable registry. And service says, I'm watching for those labels. So the pods and the service, they really talk to each other using very loosely coupled model of labels, essentially. Now, that's start from the developer perspective, from the, more from the ops perspective, if you look at it. Uh, how is my Kubernetes cluster set up? Well, there is a node that we need. There's a worker node, just like Docker, and a master node. Uh, node is essentially a machine or a VM in the cluster. Uh, master, just like Docker, there is a master, uh, which is a central control plane, which allows you to manage the entire cluster. Um, by default, it runs as a single node master, but there are lots of new tools coming along, which allows you to create a multi-master cluster as well. Um, and on the worker, of course, you know, where your containers are running, now 
In case of Kubernetes, pods only run on the worker, as opposed to Docker, where it was running by default on the master as well. Um, the, when the worker is running, the Docker host is monitored by system D on CentOS or Monit on Debian, depending upon the operating system that you're doing. So that way, you know, you have some integration built into the operating system core um, lifecycle as well. So if I were to look at a broader Kubernetes diagram, how it's going to look like, so of course I have a master. Uh, master has my key components like API server. Um, essentially, I have a kubectl, which is a CLI by which I create, just like I have a Docker CLI, I have a kubectl CLI. That kubectl CLI allows me to create resources in Kubernetes. The kubectl CLI gives a command to the API server that, okay, create a pod, create a service, create a replica set. Behind the scene, it goes as a REST API to the API server. API server then talks to the controller manager. Oh, you mean create a replica set, and the replica set has such and such labels. That means I need to look for the pods with such and such labels. That, that's the job of the controller manager. Scheduler, on the other hand, says, OK, you have identified that I need to create these pods. Let me go talk to all the pods or the workers that are available and schedule the pods accordingly and tell you exactly where the pod need to be scheduled. And a controller manager, of course, gets that information from HCD. Now, you could, you could have multiple workers. So the API server really talks to the kubelet, which is basically sort of the node agent, so to say, on worker of each node. And that's how these nodes are, pods are created. So it requests to the kubelet. Kubelet then creates the pods. And then there's a proxy, which is basically what allows you to access the application using the pods. On the right side, what you see is my client. So my client is my internet, so to say. That goes to a load balancer. Load balancer front ends my uh, proxy. And then it reaches out to the pods to actually give you a response back. And then this is sort of the final animation on this slide, where you can see this is my Kubernetes cluster. And these are how all the components work. Now, you may not need to know all these things you know, when you're creating resources. But I like to lift the hood and see what's going underneath. All right, let's talk about a little about service discovery and load balancer. Um, as we said, when you're running your Java application, typically they are multi-container application running on multi-host. Um, so in case of Docker, we have this concept of Docker Compose that allows you to run multi-container applications very easily. Uh, what you do is you define your application in a Docker Compose.yaml file. And in that, basically, you say, here are the services that I'm going to define. And in this services, you know, here are the images, here are the replicas, here are the labels, whatever I want to define. You define all of that in Docker Compose.yaml. There are multiple ways you know, by which you can specify the service name, override the file name, all those things. I won't go dig into the details. But essentially, uh, once you have your Docker Compose.yaml defined, then you say, all right, take this and deploy this on a multi-host cluster, which was created by Swarm earlier. One of the beauties of a Docker Compose is how it allows you to cut down the impedance mismatch between your different stages. So you can have one Docker Compose file. There are ways by which you can have multiple Docker Compose files, like one for, now, for example, you have a base Docker Compose file. Then you can have the configuration file, depending upon the port, the configuration values, the different images, which can then be combined together and then essentially cut down your impedance mismatch. Let me show you an example of that. So here's a simple example. Um, if you look at it, I'm saying um, on line one, for, for example, I'm giving the version, first of all. On line two, I'm saying, what are my services? Uh, line three and line 10 is where I'm saying, these are my two services. This is a DB service and a web service. And essentially, what I want to do is I want to have my web service come up and the web service be able to talk to the DB service. The key part here is on line 11 is where I give, is, it's a simple Java EE application deployed in a Wildfly container. And all that Java EE application is relying upon is a couch-based URI environment variable, which is then pointing to DB service, essentially. So the key part to understand here is you can build some sort of dependency where you can say, oh, have the DB container come up before the web container. But that is only at the container level. How your application reacts, how your application starts up could be completely separate. For example, the Wildfly container typically comes up in three to four seconds. But if you're firing up a database container, it could take much longer. So your application, that resiliency logic, need to be baked into your Java application. 
where it is pinging database, hey, are you up? Or maybe the database, for example, Couchbase, has a REST API by which you can invoke the REST API and say, hey, are you up? If you are up, then I'm ready to make an invocation. So the container level dependency can be defined by service um, um, Docker Compose, but the actual application level dependency and resiliency is developer's responsibility. Uh, you can take this Docker Compose file and then you can just deploy this uh, to a multi-host Docker. So essentially you have a big stack. In a stack you will have multiple services and a service will have multiple tasks where each task will belong to, is basically a container running. How does the load balancing work? Well, in this case, for example, I could run a service, and I'm running just Wildfly container. The key part to look at is the dash p 80, 80 colon 8080. 80. So all I'm saying is expose a port 8080 on the host to 8080 on the container. Hey, but I'm running on a multi-host. How does 8080 work? Essentially, for all the worker nodes, it exposes a 8080 ingress port. Now, when you're setting up a load balancer, Load balancer are host aware. They are not container aware. So essentially what happens is it exposes port 8080 on each of the hosts independent of whether the container is running or not. Because today the container might be running on a particular host, but then if it gets terminated, it may be rescheduled on a different host. So what happens is from your client, the request comes into load balancer. It can be redirected to any of the host, and then if it's redirected to a host where the container is not running, using IP tables, it's just automatically redirected to the right host where the container is running. So it's a single hop. It's not a huge cost for you, but it's very seamless in terms of scaling your services up and down because you are ensured that your request will go to a host where a container is running. How does service discovery work in Kubernetes? Well, uh, service, as we talked about, is an abstracts a set of pods you know, uh, using a single IP and a port. Uh, it's a stable endpoints. Uh, take a look at the configuration file right away. Now, the way we create resources, pod, service, replica set, all of that is using configuration files. Um, and if you look at this, this service configuration file is broken into three pieces. If you look at line 17 and 37, those three dashes indicate that there are three pieces to this configuration file. One before, one in between, and one after. Now, if you look at, say, line, let's look at line 39 first. It's a replica set, first of all, that I'm creating. Um, now, in the replica set, I have some metadata from line 40 to 43. Then in 44, I'm saying this is a specification of the replica set. I want to have a single replica on line 45. Then I got some labels in there. And then finally, if I go down, then in that replica set, I'm defining what containers need to be run. Um, I'm giving the replica set, or the container, a name, Wildfly RS pod, essentially. And line 53 is basically where I'm specifying the container or the pod that needs to be run. This is the exact same thing that we use for Docker Compose as well. In here, I'm using Couchbase URI, which is my environment variable. What does it point to? It points to the Couchbase service which is then created by, as part of the Kubernetes configuration file. So now if you look at, say, line two, then I'm saying this is a service that I'm creating. The service name is Couchbase Service. I've got a bunch of ports that I'm exposing over here. The key part to look at is line six and seven. In the service, I'm saying, hey, these are the labels that I'm looking for. Label is nothing but a name value pair. In this case, is app colon Couchbase RS pod. And where is that, which pod has that label? If I look at it, on line 19, I'm creating a new replica set, and that is a Couchbase pod. Line 31 says the image name. And then line 24, well, 25 through 27 says, these are, this is my metadata associated with the pod. So now this metadata is associated with the pod, and that's exactly what service is looking for, and that's where the connection is being made. And last but not the least, as we said earlier, this is sort of my connection where I'm saying, hey, use this service. Now think about this. I got my service up and running, and service has, has a set number of replicas. I can scale my replicas, replica set back, background up and down, but each pod of the replica set will have the right label, and then it will be included as part of the service accordingly. So from a developer perspective, you just refer to the service, and then behind is back-ended by the 
a replica set that's cool to you. So essentially, I have a Wildfly pod, which is then talking to a couch-based service, which then goes, talks to the couch-based pod in the back end. Yeah, um, or uh, just for fun, I could have a front-end service talking to a couch-based service, which can then talk to a couch-based back-end. So you could have multiple services and expose them. Now, one of the concepts that we'll talk a little bit later is how a service, by default, a service, pod, replica set, all of these have an IP address. Um, well, at least pod has an IP address, and so is service. But the IP address is only within the cluster. But if need be, you can actually have a service exposed outside the cluster. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, stateless containers are cool. Um, is it a good idea to run stateful containers? Um, there are lots of different thought processes, you know, if you really can run stateful containers. Yes, you can. Uh, scalability is a bit of an issue sometimes. I don't know, how would you scale it? If a container comes down, particularly in a database world, how would the database rebalancing, uh, resharding, et cetera, would work? It, a lot of it depends upon the database architecture. But let's take a look at it. What are my options for running stateful containers or persistent containers? Now, there are in Docker, there are four different methodologies that you need to be aware of. There is implicit per container. <clears throat> what that means is, if you fire up a stateful container, say Couchbase or MySQL or MariaDB, whatever it is, um, then you can fire up the container. It has a default sandbox. That means the state, that means anything stored into the database is stored into the container itself. What that means is if container goes away, data is lost. Um, or you can create an explicit volume. So you can say Docker volume create. You can create a volume, and then that's where the data could be stored. Or you can say, I can do volume mapping, where you can say, whatever is stored into the container, actually map it to a directory on my host. So if the container goes away, the data is still with me on the host. Or you can do a multi-host, which is a more reasonable solution for a production environment, where you can say, yes, my container is running on a multi-host, but I would like to store my data on a network somewhere where the mapping could be automatically done. So those are sort of the four approaches. Now, by default, if you are running it on uh, implicit per container, the data is stored into warlib docker. That is the directory where it's stored, or warlib docker volumes on the host. Um, when you explicitly create a volume, then again, the data is stored on warlib docker volumes. Um, per host, of course, is mounted within the container. Now, all you're saying is, like, for example, I know when Couchbase is storing data, is opt Couchbase war. All I'm doing is, hey, mount that opt Couchbase war to slash tilde Couchbase, or tilde slash Couchbase. So then you have mounted a container directory into your host. And then if you're doing multi-host, then there are lots of solutions like Ceph, ClusterFS, and NFS. What happens if a container crashes? Well, of course, in this case, the directory is unavailable because the container has crashed. Um, yes, you can get into the VM where the Docker host is running and have access to the volume. Is You tend to lose it pretty fast. Um, in case of explicit per container, the directory is unavailable, but you have a means to be able to get to it because you explicitly created the volume. Um, in case of per host, of course, this is on your host, so you have access to it, and multi-host access too. In case of host crash, uh, of course, the implicit, the first two cases, the directory is gone, but in per host, of course, the directory is gone too, but when you get to the multi-host, then you still have access to it. And this is sort of the last thing that I want to share here is, um, in terms of running persistent containers. So if it is shared, um, then uh, of course, your, well, whether it's shared or not, in terms of implicit sandbox, that volume cannot be shared. But in case of explicit volume, you can share the volume, but it really depends upon whether your database is able to handle that shared volume or not. And then um, in terms of per host and multi-host, there are similar strategies as well. So I think it's very important to consider when you are doing stateful containers, sort of these are the strategies that are available to me. One of the concepts that I also want to talk about is Docker volume plugin, which basically goes with the concept of Docker batteries included but replaceable. Now, by default, when you run a Docker container, it says, hey, you fired up a database container. I'm allowing you to save the data into the container. That's the default behavior. But now I want to change it and change it as in I want to write it to a network drive or I want to do something else. 
So that's sort of what this concept is. So that is a default driver for host-based volumes. Um, you can use a plugin to be integrated with external storage systems. So you may want to store the data on EBS or GCE persistent disk or whatever comes to your fancy. So this is sort of the architecture. You look at the blue boxes, that is available to you by default, which is Docker client talking to Docker host, and there's a local storage engine that is available to you where the container is storing the data. But if you want to extend it, you can use plugin client or plugin daemon, which connects to the Docker host and allows you to store data on a variety of network storages or whatever kind of storage you want to tap into. So the one that I have played with is Portworks. Portworks uh, basically um, comes in two flavors. It allows you to write stateful containers. So you can have the one that I played with is PXDev. And essentially, PXDev is a container that you will run that will tap into the uh, Docker host and allows you to store data very easily on Amazon EBS. And there's a Portbox client, which essentially allows you to gather the more state about the container and the different volumes that are attached to your host. Now look at my blog, blog.arungupta.me, and I have a lot more details about how this entire um, Portbox uh, driver would work with Docker, for example. In terms of Kubernetes, the directory, um, well, Kubernetes, again, the concept is very similar. Essentially, what you have is a directory that is accessible to your container. Um, or the container in a pod, and the directory typically outlives the containers. Um, there are certain common types that are available to you. You could have a host path, you could have an NFS, you could have the directory living on EBS, and that's sort of the important part. Now, how does these volumes work in Kubernetes? It's basically a three-step process. Uh, first of all, somebody on the network, you know, an administrator essentially will provision the volume, and that's called as a persistent volume. There's a configuration file for that. You provision the volume. Then the application developer will write a configuration file, which is called as a persistent volume claim. He says, you know what? I have provisioned the volume, which is 50 gigabytes, but now I need only 10 gigabytes, because multiple people can share that persistent volume. So here is my persistent volume claim. And then finally, in your application, which is your pod or your replica set or whatever it is, you're going to use that PVC. So it's important to understand it's a three-step process. Persistent volume, PVC, and then finally using the claim. So that's something to keep in your mind. And, but that really gives you that scalability part of it. And again, I have a link over here. Um, this is where I blogged about when I used to work for Couchbase. But you can definitely take a look at it. How can you run stateful containers? So essentially, uh, here, if you look at it, I have a Kubernetes cluster running. With one master and two worker, I got a Couchbase pod running up there, which is storing the data onto my local uh, worker in this case. And the purple box says I can expose the service to network externally. Now, in this case, you know, that is sort of the recommended model, that you know, if you're using Couchbase, then the data should be stored locally on the device itself. But if need be, I can move that out to EBS as well. And that's sort of the scalable model, essentially. But then, of course, there's a network cost associated with it, because now you're storing the data across the network as opposed to on the host. So it's a lot of considerations that you have to think about it when you're actually adopting the containerized solutions, essentially. Um, you can do persistent containers with Portworks. On my GitHub repo, there is an example, detailed example, which says, how can you do stateful sets? That's the terminology that Kubernetes calls it now as of 1.6. Well, it was introduced in 1.5, which used to be um, pet sets in 1.4, which was introduced as an alpha terminology. But 1.5, they changed it to set, stateful set. And now in 1.6 is a beta um, concept. So take a look at this blog. It does talk about how can you create a stateful set using portworks on Kubernetes. So if you are into persistent containers, that will give you some idea over there. Let's talk about the development aspect of it. Now, as we talked about it, Docker has two versions, CE and EE. In terms of CE, we talked about there's a stable version, which is done every three months. There's an edge version, which is done every month, um, starting with 1703, which is 2017 March. Then there's a 1704, 1705, 1706. And the cool thing is, you download Docker CE for Mac Edge, for example, it's a DMG. You know, it just runs as a Docker on, on your taskbar, and it automatically updates. You know, if there's a new Edge build available, it just pushes out to you. 
So that makes it really easy for you to get started with it. If you're looking at Docker CE, again, it has three different options, essentially, for you to look at. Um, you can do it for desktop, which is CE, well, win, a Mac or Windows. Then there is a server, which is a variety of Linux. And then there is a cloud. So you could run, for example, Docker for AWS, which is essentially a cloud formation template. And then there is something for Azure as well. In Kubernetes, um, I prefer to use Minikube. Minikube is a good way for me to get started if you want to do a single node uh, Kubernetes cluster. So I pretty much use Minikube quite heavily you know, whenever I'm doing development with Kubernetes. That's a good way to get started. Uh, for a multi-node cluster, there are plenty of choices, actually. Uh, COPS is the sort of most prominent one that is you know, being actively developed. It allows you to set up a multi-node Kubernetes cluster on AWS as of today, but there is experimental support for coming for GCE and other cloud providers as well. Uh, there is um, CubeUp, uh, which used to be able to start Kubernetes cluster, but that is now getting deprecated. But then there is Tectonic Installer by CoreOS. There is Cube AWS, which is sort of kind of getting abandoned as well. So this area is evolving very rapidly. Um, one of the areas, if you, wanna, if you are looking at Kubernetes on AWS, there is a Kubernetes AWS SIG that meets every other Friday. So I would say Google on Kubernetes AWS SIG and join that SIG you know, if you want to see some difference uh, on how Kubernetes is run on AWS. Let's take a look at it. How will we do rolling update? Um, what does rolling update mean? So essentially, what I have is I have a multi-node cluster. In that cluster, I have a particular version of an image running. Um, let's say Wildfly app colon one. Um, now, all I want to do is I want to do a rolling update where one by one, I want to change all the images from one version to second version. So the command that I give for that is Docker service update, uh, service name, and I, here I'm saying the new image is wildfly colon two. And so that's sort of my new image instead of whatever the older image was because it's going by the service name. And then it's saying update two at a time, which is update parallelism two. And then it says after two images have been updated, settle down the cluster for 10 seconds and then go to the next day, then update the next two. So essentially what happens in this case? It updates two, wait for 10 seconds, update next two, wait for 10 seconds, and then update next two. So that's sort of simple rolling update that is available to you as part of Docker. How does rolling update work in Kubernetes? Um, <clears throat> now, as we said, when you are running multiple replicas, those are typically run as part of replica set or the previous generation replication controller. Um, now, all I have is a replication controller created with version one. Now. Each pod in that replication controller has a label that is in etcd. So essentially, when I, and then I have an application service sitting in front of it, which says, I'm going to watch this etcd, and I'm going to take the pods that come as part of the labels, and that's sort of the pods that I'm going to expose here. Now here, I got three pods in this replication controller. The way rolling update works is, you know, you give the command, you know, and full details are available on this my GitHub repo, which talks about it in detail. But essentially what happens is Kubernetes behind the scene creates another replication controller by the same name and appends some dash dash XXX you know, images, uh, sort of some uh, random characters to end of it. So with the same labels. So essentially what happens is now application service will have three parts from the older service and three parts from the newer service or the newer replication controller. But Kubernetes rather rapidly terminate the pod once the new pods have been spin up. Then it removes the older replication controller, and it renames the replication controller. So that's sort of the process. But well, that happens for you behind the scene, but the exact command is shown on my GitHub repo. So I would say, you know, if you're looking at replication controller, that's the concept to look for. Let's take a look at the monitoring aspect of it. <clears throat> Now, Docker by itself has plenty of commands built into it you know, for monitoring it. So there is a simple Docker container stats CLI, which allows you to say, I want to monitor the container stats. So it basically uh, gives you data every second and uh, on a console, and you can take a look at it. It gives you things like um, CPU utilization. It gives you like network utilization, disk utilization. So usual statistics, but those are minimal, though. Okay, So that's important to understand. Now. Let's say you want to get fancy data. Then you can use Docker Remote API. So that's another aspect that you want to look at. 
Docker Remote API, <clears throat> if you recall, we talked about how client communicates to the Docker server. It uses a simple command, but underlying it uses a Docker REST API. So REST slash remote is the same word essentially in this case. So everything in Docker is a REST API you know, as you're communicating with the Docker host. So what you can do is you can use the Docker remote API to get more data about a container that is running. And again, on my blog, I've given a lot more details about uh, the Windows server, Windows uh, machine, as always, are a little bit finicky and a little bit touchy in this case. So depending upon what flavor of Windows you are using, you will have to configure Docker Remote API accordingly. But on my blog, I've given complete details. Here's a container that I'm running. I want to use Docker Remote API to monitor the container. And I've given details about Mac, Windows, you know, how will you configure it? Now, another aspect of it where you are running a multi-host cluster, you know, what if a cluster, what a host goes down, or a container on a particular host goes down? So for that, you have Docker, uh, Docker System Events API. So you can start monitoring that, and it'll give you more detail about your holistic state of the cluster. So container going up and down, service scaling up and down, so those are the kind of things. Now, <clears throat> with Docker 112, or 113 actually, I think, um, which was, sometime last year, November, I believe. Uh, there is an inbuilt Prometheus endpoint. Um, it's still in the early stages, but essentially, you still start getting some more data. Um, it is an inbuilt Prometheus endpoint. All you need to, need to do is put a scraper in front of it, and it starts grabbing data, and then you can front end with a very easy to use, like an Elk or a Kibana or some, some sort of a dashboard, essentially. And last but not the least option is where you can use C Advisor. C Advisor is a tool by Google. Um, C means Container Advisor. And it gives you complete details about you know, uh, containers running in your Docker environment. Now, one of the things with C Advisor is where it only gives data for the last 60 seconds. So what you need to do is when you're running C Advisor to gather the data, you really need to capture the data, and once you capture the data, that data needs to go into a time series database. So like an influx DB or something like that. And once you have it in influx DB, then of course you can front end with an Elk um, or a Kibana or a Grafana dashboard, whatever you want to do with it. So that's sort of, and those options are again well documented, and on my blog I talked about it. How would you use C Advisor you know, to monitor your containers and plot a Kibana dashboard? So this is sort of <clears throat> a preview of uh, how the Prometheus endpoint look like. So you can see all sorts of different metrics that are available to you over here. So if you particularly look towards the bottom on the left here, it talks about HTTP request, and our response, all those metrics that are available to you. And on the right, what you're seeing is some of the metrics that are available to you. So this was running on my machine. So you can see, for example, in the middle, it talks about usage per core or a total usage. You can get some fancy details there. Monitoring in Kubernetes, how does that work? Um, the good thing is, it is baked into Kubernetes itself, just like Docker as well. So here is my typical cluster. I got a master on the top, I got three workers on the bottom. There is a C advisor con uh, container that is automatically running, depending upon where you fire up Kubernetes. So if you fire up Kubernetes, for example, using COPS, then the C advisor container is running for you. <clears throat> And uh, what you also have is a heapster. Heapster is the one that is responsible for your entire state of the cluster. It captures the state of the cluster, and it does so by talking to different kubelets. So it talks to different kubelets, captures the state of the cluster, and it automatically stores the data into InfluxDB and gives you a Grafana dashboard in front of it. Now, depending upon, again, remember, um, if you are using Minikube, this is not enabled by default, but there are add-ons available to Minikube. So it really depends upon where you are running Kubernetes and these containers or this monitoring system is available to you. If not, then this can be enabled using different add-ons. So uh, my heapster is really um, talking to different kubelets, grabbing the data, storing into InfluxDB, and then you have your Grafana dashboard. So this is sort of one of the Grafana dashboards that I created. Well, there's a default one available, but I kind of tweaked it around on what kind of data I want to capture for my containers. Um, you can see there are uh, lots of different data, fancy charts that is available. So do what it makes sense for your containers and your application. Of course, there are lots of uh, commercial tools available. Some of them have a 30-day time bomb evaluation. 
So Weaveworks, for example, has a very nice integration with uh, Kubernetes. So I would say take a look at that. Um, I have particularly played with uh, Sysdig and New Relic, and I've liked those two tools and how their integration works with Kubernetes. Those are good. Um, I'm not sure if Datadog is here, but those are sort of the four primary tools that I've seen that have provide very nice integration with both Docker and Kubernetes. Boy, that was the end of it. That's it. You know? So Docker, um, of course, your references are docker.io. Kubernetes, all the information that I get is from kubernetes.io. And the slides are, of course, available. So you can go to this GitHub repo, and the slides are already live available over there. And I may not be able to take questions up on the stage, but I'm definitely hanging out down here. And I'm here the rest of the day. Feel free to talk to me. Thank you.